Okay, hi everyone. I'm going to go through a quick uh, video on the new release of Darktable, Darktable 1.4. This is a major release which contains a whole bunch of features, so um, I'm not going to go through each feature in great detail, but I'm just going to run you through it and just so you can get a feel for, uh, for the new amazing features in Darktable 1.4. We can see here on the uh, Darktable news page, we've got a list of the um, major new features. So I'm just going to run through that now. Uh, the first one is that Darktable integrates a Lua engine, which is a scripting engine, which allows you to control um, different parts of Darktable uh, and process images um, by using those scripts. There aren't a lot of scripts available at this stage. It's a new feature, obviously, and the community will write some pretty cool stuff. I mean, I've seen some uh, processing scripts for um, making time lapses uh, and that kind of thing, um, but this is only going to get um, more exciting as more of the Darktable features get exposed to the Lua engine and as people will start to work out what they can do with the, the power of it. The next feature, which uh, I think is the one that most people are excited about, is the drawn masks. In Darktable 1.2.3, the masking was limited to features within the image. You could say, let's say there's only one red thing in the image, you could mask based on that redness. Or you could say, I want to do work on only the brightest pixels or the darkest pixels, those sorts of things. But, but properties of the pixels themselves. But most people think, really, when they think of masking, they think of being able to draw an area and say, only affect that area. Well, that's now available in Darktable 1.4, and I'll just give you a quick demo of that. I've managed to load up uh, two different versions of Darktable at once here. This is Darktable 1.4, the new version, and here is Darktable 1.2.3. We can see immediately that you know things haven't changed all that you know hugely. It's still Darktable. It still looks like Darktable, um, but I'm just going to full screen these. And I'm going to load up some images uh, for us to compare. So let's import. Okay. So here's a bunch of images loaded up into Darktable 1.4. And let me just import that same set of images into Darktable 1.2.3. Now what you'll note is that I've got these set up completely default. Um, they've completely got no settings remembered. So this is how it appears when you first load up the program. So let's um, let's do a quick look at this uh, little baby bunny rabbit. This is Darktable 1.2.3. Let's say I want a low pass filter. Um, let me turn that on. You can see that that blurs the image now. I want just the area outside the rabbit to be blurred, and I want to keep the rabbit itself sharp. How can I do that now? Ah, well I can't really. In Darktable, we only have uh, these blend modes here in the low pass um, filter. So let's go and do the same thing in Darktable 1.4. Let's load up the image here. Let's see the history stack. Um, okay, so let's go and find our low pass module. Turn it on. Blend mode. Here we go, drawn mask. Now you'll notice that uh, there's parametric masks and drawn masks, as well as uniformly. Now, when you choose uniformly, you pretty much have the same set of options that you did in Darktable 1.2.3. If we look at Darktable 1.2.3, you can see that this blend mode drop-down list actually just uh, contains the options from that blend mode uniform, or blend uniform blend. So, that's that. Now, the Drawn Mask, which is the one that everybody is excited about, gives you a bunch of different tools here. You can draw with a uh, with a brush, or you can draw a circle, or you can draw an ellipse, or you can draw a mathematical shape. Let's add a path, because that's, that's going to be an interesting one. And we'll just draw this onto the image here around our little baby rabbit. And now I'm going to right-click to finish that. We can see that we're now blurring just the rabbit. I'm going to adjust it here, but if I flip the polarity now, the rabbit's sharp, everything else is blurred. And, you know, this looks pretty awful, but let's increase the size of this blend out, for example. And we now have, basically, a blur vignette on that image. Now, you know, 
I'm not going for high art here, but you know that's that's quite cool. I mean, that makes the makes the image look um, less natural because we're blurring, not based on on the distance from the lens, but that's fine. It's possible. So that's the that's the drawn masks. Just as a quick example, I'll quickly go over a parametric mask as well. Uh, what would be a good image for the parametric mask? Uh, let's have a look at this Danny line down here. Let's go to perhaps the equalizer. Let's turn the equalizer on. Let's increase the sharpness by doing something like this. Okay, now we can see that a beautiful, you know, I've increased the sharpness, or essentially the local contrast in this case, but I'm also affecting the background blur, which is making it sort of unnatural looking, the background blur there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to limit this with a parametric mask based on this yellow color. Now, again, this is going to be just a quick, quick talk. I'm not going to go over all of the details, but now we can see that I've limited my mask here to essentially just this yellow area, and I've done that using this parametric mask. Now remember that this parametric mask does not exist in Darktable 1.2.3. But anyway, we can now see that I've uh, increased the local contrast of the flower here and the background here. The bokeh has not been sharpened, so it stays nice and buttery smooth. All right, so those are the masking. Now again, you know, I'll go over those in more detail, and I have actually done that previously uh, in, in my previous videos. So now uh, we've, we can export in WebP format. So WebP format is a new uh, format designed by Google. So now if I switch to the light table here and go into the uh, export module, I can export my image as, um, I think maybe they're talking about JPEG 2000, because I believe in uh, Darktable 1, 2, 3, we have a smaller selection. Yeah, we've only got 8 big JPEG and uh, 8 16 bit PNG. Whereas there's a bunch of new <coughs> bunch of new export formats now in Darktable 1.4. Okay. Speed enhancements I can't directly demonstrate, but we got focus detection in the light table. So let's go back into the light table. Let me just select an image here and press Z. Now by default you get uh, just a picture of your image come up, um, but now there's a new feature within the settings here indicate focus regions. So let's turn that on now. Let's press Z on this image. We can see here that I have red boxes on the parts of the image that Darktable has selected are the most sharp. So another good example is probably this this dandelion. We can see that the sharpest point is just here. Um, you know, this isn't, it doesn't really make that much sense. You've got to remember though that it's it's using the embedded JPEG rather than the the raw file. So it's detecting the sharpness before you make any edits. So this makes sense, you know, we've got a sharp wing here. I'm just trying to find... Yeah, okay, so what Darktable is saying here with these blue squares is that this is close to focus, but not quite in focus. So if I had two images of this bouquet, in this case I don't, but if I did, I would be able to compare them. Now I'm just using the mouse wheel to, to, to roll through all of the images that I've got here. And um, I'm holding down the Z key as I do that with the mouse wheel to see. Here we go, there's another image which is not quite sharp. And Darktable is detecting that it's not quite sharp by using the blue focus areas. Okay, so that's that feature. Okay, so the cache copies of the images for offline files. So um, what that means is that Darktable is storing these... Uh, image previews in the light table. If the uh, images themselves disappear, then it will load just the thumbnails from the cache rather than showing you that skull image. So, like like I do, I have all my um, photos on USB drives. If they're unplugged, I can still see, you know, what the photos are that I'm looking at, even without plugging in the hard disk. We've got a few new blend modes: HSV lightness, HSV color, lab lightness, and lab color. Again, if we compare, uh, let's go into here and compare our uniform blend. Blend mode now has more items in here. So here's lab color, for example, lab lightness that they were talking about. Whereas if I go now into Darktable 1.2.3, 
and uh, look at the blend mode here, you can see that lab lightness and so forth are not there. So there's not only have we got new blend, uh, uh, new masking modes, we've also got new blend modes. Now that these new modules here are actually really cool. We have a contrast brightness and saturation module, which again does not exist in Darktable 1.2.3, so I won't bother going into that. But let's go over here to the contrast brightness saturation. We can see that we now have for these three um, things, which are something that people often want to use, we have just three easy to use sliders. Now, all of these features are accessible elsewhere in Darktable and have been for a very long time. You know, if I want to increase the contrast, it's just an easy slider here. But if I want to do it in the tone curve, I can do that as well. Same, same effect. You know, you've got a slightly more control in the tone curve, but that's that's just a good example of, of a bit a usability uh, module. We have the color balance uh, module. No, here we go, color balance. The color balance module pro probably warrants its own video, but I'll quickly go through uh, what it does. So we have the lift, the gamma, and the gain, uh, and we have overall brightness of each. And then we have the color balance, the red, the green, <coughs> or the blue. Now, so the lift, the gamma, and the gain themselves. The lift is the uh, darkest, the gamma is the midtones, and the gain is the bright, brightest. So let's say I want to make the bright values darker. I can just sort of pull those down. You can see that happening on the, uh, on the um, histogram. Uh, if I wanted to do some split tone, for example, I could increase the reds of the bright tones, of the brightest tones in the image. Um, I could make the dark tones green, for example, so that's a green-red split tone there. The next one is color mapping, which uh, replaces the older module uh, called color transfer. And what this does is it pulls the overall look and feeling of an image and pastes it into another image. Okay, let's take this image with its sort of um, bright sort of spring palette and let's use this as our source. <clears throat> so let's acquire this as our source. What I might do is increase this number. We've got a bunch of source clusters here. Now if I go over to the image that I want to use as my destination and let's acquire this as our target. There we are. Okay, so we can see that the overall look and feel, this kind of uh, orangey-green uh, color palette, has now been transferred over to this image. Now, obviously, this looks horrendous, but that's that's just an artistic filter, which, again, I'll do another separate video on. We have a new histogram mode called Waveform. Uh, we can see here that if we switch the histogram modes, uh, we can go to Linear, then we can go to waveform, then we can go back to logarithmic, I believe. Let me find an image which has um, some interesting features. Okay, this is probably a good one. Now let's switch over to the waveform. I'll just close that off. Right, so we can see in the waveform here, uh, the waveform is, is different to a normal histogram in that a histo normal histogram gives you um, just a count from darkest to brightest values. What a waveform does is the left to right now becomes left to right in the image. So we can see that uh, in this image there's some dark blues somewhere in the left hand portion of the image. It's probably this area here. Uh, there's a bunch of greens, brightish greens in this image on the left hand side. These are the bright greens here. And there's some, you know, other colors which make up the reds and the blues which make up these colors. You know, probably in this yellow sort of stuff, the reds. And what we can see here, though, is that when we get to this part of the image with the bright uh, flowers in the, in the middle here, we can see a couple of spikes. There's a spike here, reaching almost pure white, which is this line at the top here. And again, there's another spike here. So we can see that these parts here uh, correspond to these bright pixels here. So each, each pixel in the image from left to right gets, gets plotted uh, with its color broken into the color red, green, blue color uh, channels and then plotted on this image. So automatically in Darktable 1.4 if you open a, a module then you open another module the previous module you're working with collapses 
Uh, you can get around this by pressing the shift key on the keyboard to make sure that all of the modules that you've clicked on uh, stay open. And I believe you can control click. Yeah. So let's see here. Shift, shift to open these. But now I only want the, uh, the grain plugin. Say I can control click and that will collapse everything else. Just a, just a slight usability change. And you can actually uh, change that. Expand a single dark table module at a time is now ticked by default, so you can untick that to get back to the old old behavior. Okay, uh, Tobias has made a an enhancement uh, to the Bauhaus sliders. Uh, so wherever you have a slider, you can right click to get to this uh, to the Bauhaus slider. Now this allows you to to modify things uh, more uh, precisely by right clicking. But the, the feature I really like uh, is when you right click you'll now see that there's this, this flashing carrot here. And that just indicates that you can type a number. And this is true of any slider. You can right-click and type uh, a number. You can even do mathematics in there. You can right-click and do uh, one-third, for example, and it'll convert that into 0.33. Uh, there's a logarithmic mode for evaluating the base curve. Uh, this is you know, a bit probably a bit technical. And we've got linear and logarithmic modes in there. Any bug fixes, tool for measuring base curve from sample image, uh, that now allows you to more easily add new cameras to Darktable. It will compare a JPEG and a RAW and produce a base curve, and the updated user manual of course, and a bump in the GTK requirements. So that's it for my overview of Darktable 1.4, hope you enjoyed it, um, I'll see you later.